This morning, we're looking at the lectionary reading from the Old Testament today, and I had been staying in the Gospel readings, but this particular reading kind of pulled me away. Uh, it's one of the important readings of the Hebrew Bible, and especially in the story of Abraham and Isaac in Genesis. It's the account of, we remember Abraham, who was called by God, he and Sarah, who went from a foreign country, a foreign land, to the promised land many, many miles, to a foreign country where they didn't know anyone, where the customs were strange and different to the land that God told Abraham, here's where I'm going to plant you, here's where you'll bloom, here's where you will become a great nation. He was almost too old when he and Sarah decided to have a child uh, together. They, they tried for years, and so finally they used Sarah's slave Hagar as a surrogate mother, and they had Ishmael together. Sometime after that, God continued to say, your promises are going to come through your offspring of you and Sarah, through Isaac, and he was born to them as well. And they'd sent Hagar and Ishmael away. Now Abraham's only heir living with him is Isaac. And this is the one that God said, the promise will come through Isaac. We have that in light of today's reading. After these things, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. He said, Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah, and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains that I shall show you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him, and his son Isaac. He cut the wood for the burnt offering and set out and went to the place in the distance that God had shown him. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place far away. Then Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. The boy and I will go over there. We will worship. And then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on his son Isaac. And he himself carried the fire and the knife. So the two of them walked on together. Isaac said to his father, Abraham, Father, and he said, Here I am, my son. He said, The fire and the wood are here, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, God himself will provide the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together. When they came to the place that God had shown him, Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to kill his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. He said, Do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham looked up and saw a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place the Lord will provide, as it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Let us pray. Well, good and gracious God, we are your followers who have gathered here this morning to worship you. And we meditate and rest in your word today. But we honestly admit to you that there are many times that your word confounds us. We find it difficult. As we dwell in this reading today, we had asked that you would cause the light of Christ to shine through that it would give us discernment, that it would move us to action. We pray all these things in Christ's holy name. Amen. Well, if, if I were to take off my shoes uh, and hold my feet up like they do for the, you know, measuring for shoes, uh, you'd see that my right foot is about half a shoe size smaller than my left. And uh, it wasn't always that way. I wasn't born with it that way. It, uh, it happened that way. When I was 12 years old, my brother, my older brother, Bob, bought a motorcycle and enjoyed riding around and taking it out all kinds of places and trails, and I'd ride with him sometimes. And 
We went out to the woods one place, it was near Sepulpa, and we were driving on some trails up to the woods, and these are trails that we cut ourselves, so they had some, uh, you know, some little stumps and things like that sticking out, and uh, we were going up and down the hill to have a great time, and we went uh, up one hill and hit like a little stump, and it kind of pitched us a little bit forward, and when you're riding, I was riding on the back with him, and, and uh, when I went, when we went up in the air, kind of a little bit, a little bit crazy, but not too bad. I wrapped my legs around like a horse, which is not the best thing to do to a motorcycle. And, and uh, the, the shoes I was wearing were not very heavy, and it pulled the shoe off of my right foot and tore up my heel. And uh, oh, it was terrible. It, it was that, you know, the oil and the grease get in it, and they rushed me to the hospital and the ER. And they said my Achilles tendon was shredded about 50%. And it was, it was a pretty rough time. Uh, the doctors were not sure that I would walk again. At least they thought, you know, I'd probably walk with a limp. And I went through four surgeries on that, uh, including two skin grafts from my leg, went on to try to heal that. I was off my feet and walked on crutches for about six months. For a 12-year-old, that's like an eternity. You know, you can imagine. It was, a, it was a grueling time for me, but I did manage to, uh, get momentum back and be able to walk again. And I actually uh, started for my soccer team and my basketball team that fall uh, later that year. Although I did run with a limp a little bit at the beginning of the season before working back into shape. Um, if you've ever seen me play, you probably know that the team, both teams are not very good. So, no, not. <laughs> but I enjoyed it and it was a good time. As I, as I talk about that, and. You know, that was a time of great suffering in my life. Do I believe that God put that there to test me in life? Certainly learn things out of it, but do you think that's what happened? Do you think that God kind of organized these events that I would go through this so that I could gain? It's kind of an interesting question as we reflect back on our own lives, our own suffering, the things we've gone through. Sometimes we may ask, is God using that or is God putting me in that situation for that reason? That brings us kind of to today's scripture. I'm going to come back to that, but, but I want us to look really at this scripture uh, from Genesis today. In the New Testament, Hebrews actually talks in chapter 11 about Abraham. And we go kind of through some of the faithful deeds that Abraham has done. And Hebrews is quite clear saying uh, that this is a test from God. This is a test, and that Abraham, in a sense, passed the test. Now, as you think about God testing us in this kind of way, there's been some, also some critiques of this passage within and outside as well at the church. Some say that it's immoral for God to kind of put such a thing on any parent. Others outside the faith have said things like, why would you worship a God who had asked such a thing of you. But that's not what God would ever do. So as we look at this critically, as we think about this, what we have to do is, is kind of take, take our church glasses off and look at it kind of critically from just an outsider's perspective. If we were to see this account in a newspaper today and read about somebody named Abraham doing this kind of thing, what would you think about it? You know, binding his son, he put him on some wood and get ready to kill him, and then all of a sudden he quit and then sacrificed uh, a goat instead. Did you think he was kind of crazy? <laughs> now, now imagine that he's got this big, thick beard and he's wearing robes. <laughs> You'd call him a terrorist. You know, the media would crucify him in public. And let me be clear, your pastor did not just call Father Abraham a crazy terrorist. You know, I said that if someone today were to do the things he did, you know, maybe it would kind of look that way. Rabbi Joseph Hertz, who was an important rabbi in Great Britain for years, said that what he surprised me, he said, for the Semitic people in Abraham's day, child sacrifice was kind of a norm among the culture in that area. And so he said, what's surprising is that God, not would, God would call him to do that, but that God would prohibit him from doing it, which is kind of an interesting perspective. 
His neighbors were all used to animal sacrifices. It's quite clear that animal sacrifice was quite common. And so as they think about what you think about as the sacrifice of a child in that culture, in that day and age, would be all the more powerful for appeasing God. In the sense that a sacrifice of an animal is a part of my livelihood, a part of my worth, and I give that over to God, trusting that God will bless me, or in some kind of atonement for some sin I have committed. And so if I'm giving over my life, livelihood and trusting in that way by giving an animal, how much more trusting would it be to give over your livelihood of your own flesh and blood? You see, because they didn't have Social Security or, or Medicare or Medicaid, anything like that. No, no kind of helps for the elderly. It was your children who took care of you. And so to give your only son maybe seemed to him to be the ultimate sacrifice and the ultimate test of faith. Can you hear his friend saying that? You think you're faithful? You think you're faithful? Have you ever sacrificed a child? Come on, Abraham. You're not really faithful. So, I think it's not necessarily God that's calling Abraham to do this, but Abraham believes that God is calling him to do this. Rabbi uh, Yosef Ibn Kaspi, an early Spanish uh, rabbi, wrote that Abraham's imagination led him astray. He said that it's just too morally repugnant for God to do this. I don't think it was his imagination. Is maybe a kind of a dilution of what God was calling him towards through the animal sacrifice that later Jews practiced quite commonly. As we think about testing, as we think about God testing Abraham, one of the beliefs we have of God is that God is omniscient, omniscient that God is all-knowing. And so if God is all-knowing, why would he need to test any of us? Why would God need to test any of us, if God is omniscient. Scripture, as we look at Scripture, really seems to lead us to the idea that God is not interested in human sacrifice. Let's look at Jeremiah. We have a Scripture up here in the passage. This is from 32, 35. It says, They built the high places of Baal in the valley of the son of Hinnom to offer up their sons and daughters to Molech. Though I did not command them, nor did it enter my mind that they should do this abomination causing Judah to sin. So what's going on here is that there was child sacrifice going on in Jeremiah's day, and God's saying, good grief, I never imagined that they would do such a thing. It's unthinkable. So here we see God saying that child sacrifice is unthinkable, leading, leading us to say that maybe that was not God's voice asking for that awful thing in Genesis, if God says it's unthinkable. As we go on, we'll look at the next scripture. Is from Micah. Micah is asking rhetorical questions. And shall I give rivers of oil and thousands of rams as burnt offerings? And then he says, shall I give my firstborn son for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? And then he comes to say, no, no, you shouldn't. He's told you, O world, what is good and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and love kindness and to walk firmly with your God. Now, we all know that Jesus said many times, let the children come to me. And he was blessing them and praying for them and doing all kinds of good things with the children, which was a very different kind of thing to happen in his day. And he also had this to say. This is, from, this is found in all the Synoptic Gospels, but I like Luke uh, 17 too. It says, it would be better for you if a millstone were hung around your neck and you were thrown into the sea than for to cause one of these little ones to stumble. So we have from both the Old Testament sources and the New Testament sources this idea that child sacrifice or the harm coming to any little children is abhorrent to God. We see in the letters of John, they remind us that God is love. And it reminds us that God loves each and every one of us. Sometimes as we imagine that God is testing us, in some form or fashion. What's really happening is that the world is revolving around us. And we imagine that God <coughs> is testing us because obviously everything is about us. So if someone were to 
drink too much and swerve into your lane and hit a head-on collision and, and you get a terrible auto injury and you're, you're wondering, God, are you testing me to get through this? What we're imagining is that God is somehow controlling that other person's life to make them drink too much, to get in the car and to do this kind of thing and to hit you head-on. I want to say that, I hate to tell you this, but you're not that important. God is not going to break someone else's free will, break into someone else's free will to cause suffering to happen to you so that you'll learn a lesson from it. We don't believe that's how God operates. We as, as United Methodists are Wesleyan, Armenian in our roots, and we have a strong sense of free will. We say it in our profession of faith. You accept the freedom and power that God gives you to resist injustice and evil in whatever form it presents itself. So we believe in that. The freedom. We have the freedom to do what's right. The freedom to do what's wrong. God gives us that freedom. And God does not impinge upon that freedom. God may influence or, or try to move us in directions. Inspire, certainly. But force, like a puppet. We don't believe that that happens. We don't believe that God works that way. So testing for us is a little bit different for Christians. As we consider the cross, as we consider the suffering that Jesus died upon the cross, we understand that suffering and death are not the final answer. That God works out resurrection to happen. And we believe and we trust that resurrection can come through any situation. God certainly does not cause these things to happen. But God can work some good from any evil or bad that does occur in our lives. So there's a difference in understanding, a difference in thinking. It requires us to kind of critically think about how God works in our lives and how God works in the lives of others. So as we think about God loving us, but also we think about testing. I know that many times when I've been tested in life, I have learned. And I have come through stronger than when I started. And that it actually helped me along the process. So how does the love of God work in our lives when you and I meet difficult tests? I think that's the critical and crucial question that we look at from Genesis today. Fred Craddock tells a story. He and his wife, Nettie, were uh, in New York and they were visiting with a pastor in Chautauqua, and this particular pastor had no arms. He was born without any arms. He didn't have anything from the torso up. He was just, just straight up, born that way. And he was sharing kind of his story. He said, I remember the first time I ever dressed myself. He said, wasn't it a fun day? Every day, my mother would dress me. She would feed me. I like that every day. Dress me, feed me, care for me each and every day. Couldn't do anything. I got pretty big, and finally she just brought a pile of my clothes to my bedroom one day. She put them on the bed. She said, you're going to have to dress yourself today. And she walked out. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. <laughs> and he said, how can I dress myself? You know, he's yelling this even as he's leaving the room. I don't have any arms. I don't have any hands. He said, I, I screamed for a while. And I started crying. He said, I got so mad, I was kicking. <laughs> rolling around on the floor. Kicking and screaming. You know, that, you can only do that as a human being for so long. <laughs> we wear ourselves out, you know. If I, if I leave, so, the tears are gone. <laughs> he looks over, he sees that clothes, he sees himself. He says, well, I guess if I'm going to get dressed today, I better try to dress myself. He said, so I struggled with those clothes for a couple hours. And finally, I managed to get a couple of them on. That's the first time. I'm quite proud of myself that I was able to accomplish what I did. And I, I got better at it. He said, I, it wasn't until later that I found out that my mother 
was in the next room crying. Understand how God is supporting us? You understand how God is with us in our times of trial, in our times of suffering, how God leads us to new things? When I was, the worst part of my accident and illness was when I went to the hospital, and I, I was there and with four other boys in St. Francis Hospital in Tulsa, three of them, there was four of us total in the room, and that was back when they didn't allow parents to spend the night. They had visiting hours. They were very strict on these visiting hours, in and out, you know. When it's time to go, they shuffled you out. And so, I was, the first night, I remember that, I, was, I did not want my mother to leave. And she was going to leave, and it wasn't because I was scared to stay all night. I've done that before in other places, and it wasn't scary to me. It was because I was not able to use the bathroom by myself, and having a bed rest, I couldn't get up. And so I had to ask for help. And it was at 12 years old, such an embarrassing and seemingly at the time shameful thing to have to ask. All the nurses were women, you know, and <laughs> it, was, it was hard. And so, but she left. We got through uh, that time. And I remember those other boys, they all had various things that were wrong with them. We got them, they gave us these like soap that we were supposed to wash with, you know, sponge baths and stuff. And we were getting soap fights with them, you know, and, and they were great missiles that you could throw across the room at each other. And the beds would raise up and down, which we didn't have electric beds at home, and so we'd get in races, you know, and try to try to do this back and forth. And I remember one boy in particular, he'd had surgery that day, and somebody brought him some cherry chocolates. And he started eating them like there's no tomorrow. And I said, I don't think you're supposed to be eating anything. Uh, after surgery, you know, you got all that stuff in you. I don't think that's a good idea. He goes, ah, I'm fine. No, I'm sure stuff. And just, I didn't know when. And after about 10 minutes, he said, I don't feel so good. I said, you're looking a little green. Up they came. All the cherry chocolates right there. Such a nauseating smell. And to this day, I can't eat cherry chocolates. It was awful. It was awful. So as we think about that, those boys helped get me through a tough time. And I saw God was there getting me through it through those boys. God helped me through this time in important ways. And I think about, did I learn anything from all this? Of course, we all learn from suffering. I have a strength of character that I never would have had if I hadn't gone through that. I have a compassion for others in the hospital as I pray for them. I know what it's like to be there. I know some of the fears of going into surgery. I know those things. It, it strengthened me as a person. It, it built my character. I have a, a strength of will to get through things when I face adversity because of this. And so sometimes I think, if I had to do it all over again, would I do it? I don't know. <laughs> I can't say for sure, yes, that I definitely would. But I do know for sure that I am better, and I'm kind of leaning towards that at this point in my life. I don't think God caused my brother to hit a stump that was in the trail. I don't think God caused me not to remember to wear boots that day so that I could learn from this terrible experience. I think sometimes life throws us curveballs. Life can be difficult. There's all kinds of crazy things that happen out there. But God used a bad situation to build me up. In the moment of my cross, there came the resurrection. And so as we look at the story of Abraham today, we realize life throws us some pretty wicked curves. But God is seeking time and again to provide us a ram. And in case we misunderstand the point, God loves us more than we can know. More than we can know. And often, in our trials, God may seem absent. What's really going on is God may be in the next room weeping. 